Hi, class, and welcome to week two. So, yay, congratulations, you guys, on making it through the first week. Hopefully, everybody has now had time to get through class. You guys all have your uh, course text books and uh, you know everybody is on track if not please do not hesitate to reach out to me guys you in any way possible give me just a minute oh oops wrong thing here give me just a minute to go open up our powerpoint a little funny today give me just a second share content here we go All right, guys, so uh, uh, before we start the lecture, just a little housekeeping type stuff. So uh, first of all, uh, discussions will always be posted no later than Tuesday. So I'm in the process of working on those. You'll see those before midnight tonight. And then feedback for your assignments will always be posted no later than Friday each week and what I will do is I will make sure to post an announcements once that feedback and your grades are in the grade book like worry or, or wonder when that's in there you'll be able to see that announcement and then you will know and then you know once again if you have any questions any, any help with anything guys please do not hesitate to reach out to me so um I know uh, when you go and you look throughout class, uh, our course shell is set, so uh, we couldn't change that this semester. So you'll notice that it's telling you to have three discussion posts each week. That is not the case, guys. Because of the COVID-19, you are only required to have two posts uh, this semester. So the main thing is just uh, the due dates, just make sure you have that initial post on Wednesday, and then you have until Sunday, the end of the week, to get in your participation post. Um, the assignments, they're always due by Sunday. And uh, don't necessarily think of that as the to due date, you know, think of that as the last date that you are the last yeah the last day that you have to submit that assignment you know that gives you guys time to uh, ask questions or if you need any help with anything if you want me to look over it before you submit it I, I am more than happy to do any of that guys of course though saying that I know that you know all our schedules are different and we're all busy and so sometimes you know you don't get to it to the last minute it you know either way guys i am flexible and as long as you just uh reach out and communicate with me you know we could always work things out with class and then like i said i'm here to help in any way possible it's important that we are always supporting our work so no matter what class you're in what subject you're taking you want to always I have those APA elements of your in-text citations and then your matching reference. Uh, last week, if you watched that lecture at the end, I kind of went over and gave you guys some uh, real simple tips on how to do APA in your post. And, you know, it can, it can help you in any of your classes. It really is just a simple little formula. And once you get that down, it certainly makes that task less daunting. And then that helps, you know, clear up that space in your brain so you have more room for your voice and your critical thought and development. And when it comes to ABA, guys, try to paraphrase. Don't, you know, copy and paste in other people's work. It's more important that you're showing your critical analysis and your voice as far as, uh, you know, looking, at, especially in our class, because we're looking at history. And, and we're talking a lot about facts and, and you know, it's kind of hard. We, we can't change those facts around, right? But we can change our understanding and the way that we go and present those facts. And so it's more important that we show that than, you know, having a bunch of other people's work copied and pasted into our work. And, and along that note too, you know, we always want to follow that 80-20 rule of academic writing where we're and 80% uh, our own words and no more than 20% cited sources. I do have a, uh, if you go under the modules and scroll way down to the bottom, there is a link that says check my draft. And basically what that, that's just a place where you can go and submit your work for, and you can use that for any class 
if you want to, you know, if you're taking another class and you want to use that to check your paper, at, that's perfectly fine with me, guys. I don't check that folder unless you, you want me to go and look at your paper. But that is there as a tool for you guys to go in and check your work before you submit it for grading. So I just encourage you to use that. Um, it, it connects it to turn it in. So it checks, you know, similarity, plagiarism. And I believe I have it set up to help with the like grammar and punctuation and, and all that writing stuff too there. All right, guys. So we started class last week by looking at the beginning of the 19th century. And of course, the, you know, other than like industrialism, because, you know, this was like the first time in history we had this like, uh, probably other than the invention of fire, you know, because that was like a monumental technology. Here we have industrialism and, and we've made these machines that can do so much for us and, and was uh, able to uh, help us connect to each other in, in just so many different ways. But you know, uh, and, but in those endeavors, we see uh, we see that ugly side of humanity too, and and uh, you know we see it explode to the point that we have worldwide conflagration, and uh, that's what made World War One different from any other battle or conflict that you know we have seen in the history of the world and the history of humanity, and it was because it was a war that affected all peoples of all you know uh, ethnicities cultures religions sexualities it didn't matter it affected everybody on every known uh, you know part on every known continent in the world so that was huge and uh, so as we know last week we went through uh, those battles we looked at uh, the people involved in World War One, and then uh, we kind of looked at who got the blame for that. So I think when we look back to World War One, even though Germany got the blame for it, and then of course that led to World War Two, I really think that you know all nations were in were uh, to blame, and and more specifically those major European nations were to blame because they were all locked in that battle of, uh, you know, wanting to get out and get more resources, wanting to conquer more land, wanting to prevent their neighbor from being able to do that, right, guys? And so, you know, because of that, we see that tension build into, uh, you know, the most heinous act, I would say, other than like, you know, rape and, and like, human sex trafficking you know like war is like the worst part of 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 uh, uh of being human and you know we should never be so mad at each other that we get to that point and you know once again that goes back to why we study history so that we can learn from our mistakes because you know as humans we're going to make mistakes we're going to make mistakes in our own individual life journeys and we're going to make mistakes as group it's just you know the important part there is is that we learn and grow from those, right? And so that's what we start to see at the end of World War. And so, you know, we've had this huge battle. It's totally changed, you know, the way that people were living. It's totally, you know, had a mental impact on people, you know, and, and, and of course that has good and bad things attached to that. But generally, there was this kind of idea that 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 it was over. We learned our lesson. There was this feeling of peace in the air. We had the major European nations, and of those, the three were um, Wilson there from the United States. We had George there, and uh, uh, Lord George, Lloyd, excuse me, George, and Great Britain, and then we had. Uh, I'm probably going to uh, butcher his name, guys. I'm so sorry. I think it's uh, Clemenceau is how you, you say that or, or something along those lines in France. So those were the three powerhouses that emerged at the end of World War One. And uh, at this point, Russia was Russia was kind of in the background in many ways because she had her own internal problems that she was trying to take care of. And that's kind of something we look at this week when we start to look at how communism um, arose in Europe. And of course, you know, Russia was one of the um, 
probably one, one of the, the main countries to truly, uh, you know, grab on and adopt those communistic ideas that uh, Marx and uh, Engels came up with. You know, we always contribute uh, communism to Karl Marx, but there was actually another guy that he worked with named Frederick Engels, who was uh, just as instrumental and writing that manifesto and coming up with those ideas. So we see these main players and then uh, because of the way that World War I went, we see Germany getting the blame. And so, uh, you know, there was a lot of battles fought on German soil and a lot of devastation to that particular part of Europe. And uh, so, so, uh, you know, it's kind of that human nature. I believe that we have to find somebody to blame at times. It's easier, you know, to this is a little psychology, guys. It's easier, you know, to point that finger and blame somebody else, but we forget that we always have those fingers pointing back at us. But nonetheless, we blame Germany for it and we start to see the League of Nations uh, come about. <clears throat> So in blaming a Germany, we see the Treaty of Versailles created, and that's really where the League of Nations come into play. The League of Nations today, we can kind of think of the EU and like the, uh, oh crap, I'm forgetting their name now, the, the, like the Worldwide Organization, United Nations. United, United Nations, I think is who I'm thinking of. But um, these are kind of like the early versions of those groups. So it's kind of, you know, they're, they're, uh, they, we see those three major countries are coming together and they're, they're just trying to kind of create a council and to, to help everybody rebuild after the war and find those, you know, positive and productive steps forward and uh, because of the devastation of World War One, you know, everybody was scrambling to rebuild their economies. I mean, if you remember from last week, some of the pictures I showed and I believe there's some uh, pictures in the textbook and such of uh, some of that damage because of the war, you know, there, were, there was a lot of rebuilding going on. And so when it came to Germany, uh, the Treaty of Versailles, I mean, they reduced their army, they took away their land, uh, you know, they, they kind of, uh, they, they made these demilitarized zones, which was just kind of like, uh, what's a good way to call those? Demilitarized zones are, are uh, like we see uh, today in Korea. It's it's kind of like an area where, where you have Somebody else is kind of patrolling, watching it to make sure that uh, you don't you don't do anything you're not supposed to. Basically, is what that is, and uh, and. Um, and we also see this idea of repatriation. So, uh, so you know, Germany overall, they, they were very unhappy about that. They felt like, you know, even though there was this general air of peace of, of you know, that we were going to have this everlasting peace, I should say, around the world, Germany felt a little disgruntled about it. They were kind of like, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's uh, you know, that idea of if somebody is trying to tell you to do something you don't want to do it then right once again goes back to just typical human nature guys it's just kind of how we are you know if someone's like no you can't do that we tend to be stubborn and say well i'm not you know watch me and kind of attitude right so germany felt that way too they were like you know we want peace too, but you're forcing us to do it a certain way and so we just don't like that and and plus you know we're having to rebuild our economies just like everybody else. And, uh, you know, we're getting the brunt of all of this. And, you know, that that unhappiness uh, with that. And so what we see on this slide are a couple of pictures. We see one of uh, Wilson, Wilson, George, and uh, Klimushu there and uh, at the uh, peace conferences. And it was the Treaty of Versailles because they had the uh, peace conference there 
in Paris and in, in, in France. And uh, so we just see that picture and, and it's a, uh, I, I, I like that picture because we see, uh, you know, we see the three of them. You get a general feeling that uh, of that piece, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. You know, they kind of all look relaxed. They're kind of, you know, they kind of seem like they're in good spirits. And uh, and I think that's important to, to, to you know, uh, remember that for later, because once we get to the end of World War II, and we see some of those uh, pictures of the uh, conferences that we had. We see that we can definitely see a change in everybody's demeanor and kind of the uh, just tension in the air. And then, of course, that leads to our next series of events during the Cold War era. So it's it's uh, I also like this picture, too. And uh, talking about this idea of peace because it's it's very ironic, guys. At the end of World War One, there was a, it was like a law. I don't think, but it, they probably called it more. Um, it's not really a law. Actually, it is a law. It's the Kellogg Act. That that's what I was looking for. It's the Kellogg Brand Act. And basically, what this said was that everybody all around the world agreed that we would never, ever, ever go to war again. Again, and everybody signed it. And uh, that's what I'm saying. It wasn't like specifically. It was kind of like one of those. Uh, underwritten laws, I guess you could say is that, you know, it was never really formally introduced as somehow or another, but, you know, everybody agreed to that. And that is actually an act that is still in effect today. So it's just, it kind of blows my mind to know that we did that. And somehow that just like, it gets shoved under the mat. You know what I mean? It's like, it's weird. It's like technically every war or battle or loss of life in those manners that we've had since World War One has like broken that law that it's just, you know, one of those things we just, you know, power and money and, and authority seem to uh, move those uh, more positive and productive things to the side, I guess we can say. And so what we see in our other picture here is uh, you guys will, will come to find that throughout class, I like to, you know, put a, put a lot of pictures lectures because and I think to get that feel of history you know it helps to try to put ourselves in the places of the people at the time try to try to understand what they were going through what they were thinking and you know I think we come to understand that you know they weren't they, they're no different from us just because they lived in another time period it doesn't mean that they had different you know emotions or different experiences not experiences, of course, they experience the world a little bit differently, but, you know, we're all human beings and we all go through the same things in life for, for the most part, right? So I think when we get a better understanding of that, studying history, you know, it goes back to we just, you know, find that better understanding of ourselves as individuals and collectively so that, you know, we can move forward in those more positive and productive ways. So what we see with this picture on the right is a little bit of German propaganda and it's satirical because, you know, it was a little tongue in cheek as far as the Germans, you know, the German perspective of it was concerned. So what we see is a German man, he's all beaten and worn down. He's, you know, all bruised and looks all scarred up, maybe a little malnutritious. And he's tied to a tree. And and behind him we see that uh that um this kind of stereotypical view of a British gentleman, you know, they're very happy and jolly. And of course, he's overweight because the Brits, they're so well off and well fed and they've kind of like they're on top of the world and they have everything. And then on the other side of the picture, we see a little bit of social Darwinism and, and we see, um, you know, justifications for imperialism and colonialism in that character. It's a character of Africa, and uh, so we see how at this time, you know, people from Africa, people who weren't from, just basically anybody that wasn't from Europe was not considered to be fully human. And, uh, you know, we, we talked about that a little bit last week of looking at the Armenian genocide and then looking at Kipling's poem and your assignments and then... Um, 
And throughout our discussions, we talked a little bit about Darwinism and racism. And so what we see in this picture is uh, this is, is that uh, even though we had, you know, there was this worldwide view that these groups of people were considered subhuman. Oh, look at the poor Germans. They have now been taken down a level. You know, they're so uh, are being beat up so much that even the subhuman people are beating them up. So you can see how you, you can just see how those kind of things can breed that discontent and that disgruntledness in people. Of course, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to justify any of this as being a right way of thinking about other people's because it's absolutely not. It just goes back to helping us understand how, you know, the, these nations and, and people have taken the steps in, in the history essentially that they have. And so, you know, by by being fed this type of, of propaganda and this type of energy of, of and, and this type of, uh, I guess energy would be the right word, imagery is what I'm trying to say, that it creates that, that disgruntledness that allows hate and to breed. And, you know, that's exactly what we see with the rise of Hitler and, and, and uh, these other fascist governments that we see emerging after World War I. All right, so moving right along, we see, uh, you know, not only in Germany, but just throughout the whole world, we see changes because of World War I. And a lot of that had to do with changing of, of just the maps and those changings of, of land and uh, resources and, and just how people were kind of distributed, I guess is a good way to say that. And at the same time, we see um, these new nation states emerging. And so basically, what does that mean? That means that we see specific cultural groups finding their independence, gaining their voices. And that's important because as we move, you know, closer to present day history, we'll see how some of these uh, nationalist movements, some of these wars that we've had, especially in the 60s during the Cold War, and that a lot of that had to do with, you know, the, these ideas of uh, people wanting their own independence. You know, we'll look at, you know, with colonialism and, uh, you know, how people were ruled by that for so long and then, you know, wanting to break away. It's, it's a lot of a lot of chaos going on in our past. Right, guys? And uh, so in all of these groups, you know, finding their independence, finding their, um, uh, you know, trying to find their voices in the world. We also, you know, once again, see that ugly side of human nature because we see minorities, you know, so what basically what does that mean? We see that specific groups start to get segregated and kind of pushed aside. It's like, okay, we're all going to move forward now, but not you guys. You guys aren't involved in this. And that's important because, you know, that leads us to uh, some of the decisions with the Holocaust. And, and once again, you know, these ideas that Hitler and the um, and uh, his party had about uh, uh, the Aryan nation and that rise of, of uh, you know, race and you know just kind of all that craziness that goes along with that right guys and so we don't just see these states uh, are uh, the face of europe changing we also see middle the middle east is changing and of course this is important because as we move along we'll see how um you know Ma there are major events happening in the Middle East that affect us today. We'll see, you know, we'll, we'll start to put those pieces together and see how colonialism and, and you know, war and, and these rechanging faces of uh, the lands, how that all uh, has led to uh, the conflicts that we see in the Middle East. And so um, basically with the Middle East, we start to, you know, we see that Ottoman Empire starting to dismember. So, you know, what does that mean? The same thing as, as what we see with those new nation states that are forming in Europe. We see, you know, that that breakdown of this larger system so that that these smaller cultural groups are able to start exerting their independence and, you know, finding their place in the world. 
And so in all of that, uh, we know that uh, France and Britain especially, they, they had a heavy uh, colonial system going on in the Middle East there and, and, and kind of the northern part of Africa. And so, you know, they were they were really involved in the daily lives and and so as the ottoman empire starts to dismember as europe is kind of trying to uh um lessen its authority over its colon uh, its colonized peoples because uh there's also this idea that a uh, woodrow wilson comes up with it's uh the 14 points and um uh, Basically, in the 14 points, uh, uh, the main thing that always stands out for me is the idea of you know, one one of the, the points of these peace treaties and conferences and, uh, you know, the United States now being able to come in and kind of lend a hand and helping to rebuild Europe was the idea that Europe needed to ease up some of its control over the, you know, the, the smaller nations that, that uh, she was possessive of, right? And in doing that, it was this idea of self-determinism everybody and uh well, it was actually you know they were talking about it in the context of uh, nations and countries every nation every country has its you know basic human god-given right to uh, uh be independent to govern themselves you know to have their cultures respected and and of course everybody thought that was a great idea it's like yes we can do that everybody needs to be self-determined but what ends up happening those nations that we consider uh uh you know second and third world they get you know once again those ones that were like well they're really not really human anyway we they already need us there taking care of them so so we probably don't need to have self-determinism for them we're still going to be in control but uh, hopefully that makes sense because once again that comes into play later on as uh, as we move through class two. But you know that idea of uh, you know self determinism it does mean that every nation state, every cultural group, every group period you know has uh, does have the right to um, and to build themselves up and to be a part of of um of the program i guess is what you can say and so like i said so you know europe thought that was okay for them but they really weren't too cool with doing that with their their colonized nations but as a show of good faith you know they modernize and get with the times they they did start kind of relaxing some of their control and so we see these mandate systems form and that's really important in the middle east because of these mandate systems um in the steps that uh, a lot of those cultures and you know in india and then right there in the middle east you know iran iraq israel palestine a lot of the uh steps in history that they have taken has been because of these mandate systems and kind of some of this confusion and chaos that was created by colonialism and then even in those ideas of self-determination as we will see especially during the cold war these larger nations will kind of use these smaller nations for their own self-interest so you know that comes into where it's really important that we make sure we have leaders in charge who definitely have the best interests of everybody at heart but we'll get more into that when we go into the cold war because that will start to make a little more sense there <clears throat> and so guys with this slide and basically what we see is just like i've been talking about and that changing face of europe and if uh i can't really remember so i don't expect you guys to but last week we looked at a map and and uh, all i can tell you is that we did not see this much culture on that map but now that we are past world war one we definitely see more of these breakdowns of the land you know so so we see and these nation states start to emerge and like i said understand because you know we're all human beings we all want to be a part of of uh you know this experience that's the reason we're all here is to learn and grow together and and just that just to be together and to find those positive productive ways to do that 
and you'll hear me say that a lot, guys, and I don't see it say that as in, you know, like life is all unicorns and rainbows. We will have things that will challenge, that will challenge and, and you know, conflict in our lives. You know, it's more though we have to, you know, learn those ways of dealing with that that are less destructive because there are other ways to deal with conflict and challenges that, that you know, aren't as destructive. So with this slide, it's just a, a map showing us some of those changes to the Middle East. And so we really see the influence of the Brits and the French with their mandate systems. And of course, once again, this is important because if you notice, you know, those heavily mandated areas are, are you know, those areas that in, in the most uh, present history are our times right now that uh, we see a lot of conflict going on there. And, you know, a lot of it just has to do with, you know, th these cultural groups, you know, trying to exhort their independence and find their own voices and their own way of uh, being and living in this world and, and you know, the, the, the pressure from these outside sources, you know, and some examples of, of how we can kind of understand the negativity and the hatred that goes along with some of those things. And of course, once again, I don't say that to justify those. It's just about trying to understand them because, you know, we can't change any of that until we have that understanding, right? So, as I was saying, even though there was this general feeling of peace, you know, people felt like they, they were getting to stand up and become more independent. We also have that other side, too. So, um, you know, World War One, we saw over 10 million people died and, you know, civilians and included in that. We see, uh, you know, just the, uh, the human suffering. I mean, we can't even put a number on that because, you know, when you go through something like war and that's hopefully something none of us are, are you know will ever have to experience but you know we can't really imagine that that mental you know that mental anguish that that causes to people so you know we do see a rise in mental disorders this is where we start to see the rise of mental institutions and and uh, you know actually trying to <clears throat> and get away from that more like torture type mental institution, you know, of course it took probably to the 1980s to where we totally got away from that. But, you know, starting to definitely see these, uh, you know, how to uh, cure people mentally. We see the rise of Sigmund Freud and psychoanalysis during this time. And it's just all about, you know, once again, helping people heal and helping us learn how to all work together and move forward in those positive and productive ways ways. So when it comes to the League of Nations, you know, even as good as of intentions as they had, they weren't, you know, quite as strong as they could have been. But the main that uh that that you know really disrupted that piece was just the, you know, just the way that Germany was treated. And then we have the Great Depression. So like I said, so everybody had been devastated pretty much by the war. And so everybody was rushing to rebuild their economies. And so, you know, in all that rebuilding uh, that we start to see economic um, repercussions, that's a good word for it. And when we think of the Great Depression, we usually think of it as just being something specific to America because of the collapse of the stock market. That was kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back there. But in reality, we call it the Great Depression like we call it the Great War. It's because it's something that affected everybody all over the world. And, uh, you know, the people that lived in, uh, you know, those parts of the world that were heavily colonized, you know, that were already living in, in these horrible conditions, it didn't affect them as much as, say, you know, maybe people in the United States. But then at the same time, you know, they had to deal with different things, too. So there were some of those places like... Uh, Here's a good one over in uh, Vietnam, the Vietnam Islands and, and uh, some of the places in Africa, what uh, like France and Britain did to uh, kind of ease some of those uh, economic uh, effects of the Great Depression is they forced their their colonized mandated uh, um, 
areas to like buy stuff and was kind of taking stuff from them. So, you know, really oppressing people to help build themselves up. Kind of crazy to think about that, huh, guys? But uh, so, so as I was saying, so so we start to see um, this depression take take root in kind of uh, um, Europe before it actually gets to America. So the reason I'm pointing that out is because that's another that was another thing that added to Germany's discontent with the end of World War One because Germany got really hard hit by the depression and. Of unemployment was uh, high. I mean, uh, you see those uh, old pictures of people standing in the bread lines and uh, it, it was just, uh, you know, really, really bad. And I know right now with the COVID-19, you know, we're experiencing really high unemployment rates and, and you know, it's kind of comparable to the Great Depression. And so, um, I got really, really negative there. But the, my point is, is, is that, uh, you know, it seems like it's uh, comparable to what was going on here during the Great Depression, and and you know what we have to do is have that hope that we'll we'll work it out. I I, I believe we will work it out. Things are really scary and, and kind of weird right now but you know guys we are writing history as we speak you know five ten years from now we'll be talking about the covid era in history and uh, so it'll be interesting to see how we write this in and and i really do feel hopeful and um you know that that will move forward in a positive ways there but i know unemployment is something that's you know people are really worried about that right now and 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 uh, in many ways I guess that helps us to gain a little bit of understanding of what people were going through through the Great Depression too huh and uh, you know it wasn't all bad though because of World War one and just uh, uh, you know the Industrial Revolution and and the changes to society we see uh, not everybody was as oppressed we do see women start to move up in society and of course that's always a good thing and then um because of uh you know like all this negativity that was going on it's just the general populations they, they were very uh displeased with their governments and we have to go back to think too you know in Europe, they really even ha hadn't had this democratic kind of leader system for very long. You know, when you look at their history, they had more of this history of being under the feudal system of, of you know, living in these little villages or, or you know, just the little castle where the, the overlord was in charge and there was kings and queens, you know, and so they, they were... And, you know, uh, for the longest time, you know, people were very powerless and they had no say in who was governing them and just no say in, in any ways that they were able to live their life. So once, you know, they, they got that opportunity to, to start to have a voice and they start and then, you know, they elect these governments. Now you have this depression, so we can see our people are kind of, you know, stepping back and rethinking their decisions. So, you know, people were just, just overall, people were very disappointed in the governmental powers. And so that's how we start to see these extreme political ideologies. Uh, uh, you know, these fascist governments come, and our, our leaders, I should say, come into um and come into power and it's really kind of a a sad note when you think about it because you know people are like hitler people like mussolini they're they're like these toxic personalities that we have as human beings you know thank goodness not all of us are like that right but you know we have these this small group that have those toxic personalities and you know when we give them power and control we see, you know, the chaos and, and, you know, they just run amok with that. And, uh, you know, as bad as Hitler and Mussolini uh, was, wait till we get to Stalin. You know, I think I think Stalin was the worst of them because he was he was just blatant about it. He was like, yeah, if I can't take care of everybody, I'm just going to kill them. You don't like somebody, just kill them off. He was, he was like the original mobster gangster, you know, and that is really scary when you think of the power that that man had, right? 
And uh, so with this picture, like those bread lines and uh, I was talking about just to kind of, you know, get that idea of what people were going through during the depression. And like I said, it's kind of scary when we think about what's going on right now with the COVID-19 because we see some of these images on the news. I've seen some of them um, like people. I think is they were showing and they had those long lines like oh my goodness bless those people's hearts there right and then uh to go along with this idea of discontent with governments and you know giving this rise to these uh extreme political parties I just uh this slide we've just got some bulleted points about what each country was kind of going through individually there and then of course the main thing here is is just you know once again to note that out out of all of these you know Germany was really the hardest hit there and uh you know that was um that that played a lot into just a uh, hitler's mindset himself you know and then like i said you know we see the uh league of nations uh french united uh france united states and uh great britain kind of emerging as the uh powerhouses of of kind of the world politics world governments right and uh this time we don't see russia as involved because uh you know russia pulled out of world war one there at the end and uh, uh because they were having a lot of internal problems and it goes back to that once again those ideas of the feudal systems and you know they were still kind of under a monarchy and and uh, uh you know people people revolt when their governments aren't taking care of them and it's mostly when they start to not have anything to eat so you know once people start starving they get really mad right and so uh so russia kind of had to step back and come in and deal with her own problems like i said and so uh when we first see communism em emerge in Russia, it's it's not Stalin's communism. You know, it's definitely more uh, uh, more aligned with those ideas of Marx and Engels. More of that, you know, open economy where everybody is a member and and everybody's contributing. So you know, everybody gets an equal share of the rewards. And it was all about taking care of the people and not catering to these uh, elite classes, essentially. So, you know, so people really liked communism in Russia, we, we tend to group Lenin and Stalin into that. And like I said, two totally different uh, personalities there. And then Trotsky was, uh, I don't know. Once again, he was he's not the psychopath that Lenin was. He was kind of uh, uh, more of a neutral in the middle, which kind of made it easy to get so Stalin can get in. So that wraps up our lecture. And like I said, you know, we can definitely see with uh, uh, just the uncertainty brought about by World War One, the way that uh, it changed, uh, not only the way that people lived, but the way people were thinking, the way people, you know, interacted with each other, you know, it changed, you know, social conditions for people that uh, even though people were hopeful, and they wanted peace there were still these things going on behind, you know there, there was still this underlying um, um disgruntledness i i guess that's my word for today to describe it huh disgruntledness that people were undergoing because uh, it comes down to those basic needs like i just said with russia people felt like that you know the people who stepped up to be in charge were not taking care of their needs and and that creates a lot of fear and anxiety and so when that happens we we want to you know we look to uh somebody that's going to provide us with uh, another option you know the key there if history teaches anything it's that uh we should be very and say me 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 pick me i have all the solutions i'll make it all better because that's what we see with these fascist governments that we will talk about this week that their idea of making it better was definitely not for the greater good. So, all right, guys, that wraps up our lecture. And so just real quickly, I just, uh, you know, want to uh, just go over APA and writing again. So with our week two assignment, um, it is going to be an essay. So just, you know, think of that, that uh, basic essay of the five paragraphs that I talked about last week. I actually, 
I have a video specifically on that that's a lot shorter. So I, I'll, I'll post that up for you guys too. And uh, hopefully that will help because, uh, you know, guys, when it comes to APA and it comes to writing, my best solution always keep it simple, keep it basic, because it's more important that that, you know, we're, we're showing that growth with uh, um, our critical analysis and understanding of uh, the stuff that we're talking about in class. So um, just re remember with APA that easiest way to do that guys with those in-text citations is just uh you know who wrote it when did they write it i have a couple of examples here uh that are actually uh how to do the apa for the video on mussolini that you're going to watch for your um your assignment this week so you know just a couple basic ways to do that and you guys will notice that no matter what that source is, so, so no matter what that name, what that date is, you know, you're always going to set it up that specific way. I just think that helps make that a little bit easier for us to, you know, for, like I said, for us to remember so we don't have to worry so much about that. I mean, that's all you need, guys. Name and date, boom, you got it. You know, your, your teachers will be happy and then you have that full reference at the end. And, and like I said, that really helps just, uh, you know, clear that space out so we have more uh, space to help our minds get smarter, right guys? So, all right guys, and that wraps up our lecture for this week. If there's anything you need, please do not hesitate to reach out to me and uh, I appreciate everybody so much and uh, yeah guys, I will see you in our discussion. So thanks, bye. Professor Moore, can I ask you a quick question?